Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the presentation of colors. Honor Guard and Companies, Ted. Woo! Honor Guard, raise the colors. Uniform personnel, please it. Oh. Order! Oh. Honor Guard and Companies Parade Rest. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our opening prayer this morning will be delivered by Harold Godsey, retired Bloomington firefighter and department chaplain. Thank you all for being here today. I've seen a, a lot of uh, special events on TV about 9-11, uh, probably more than uh, I have ever seen before. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed that there's not as many people uh, as usual. And when we first began this, it was a lot of, a lot of folks that came out. But, but so good that you're here. Um, most of the people said, I will never forget. And... Uh, I had an uncle that was um, in World War II at Pearl Harbor in the Navy, and he was injured there. And I was just a little boy, and I remember Mom telling about that, and and uh, how Uncle Charlie was pretty bad injured, and you know. But throughout history, we, our families had uh, a lot of people in the military, and and also in the law enforcement and fire department, and and all of that. And uh, I appreciate every one of them and we have something in common uh we don't forget um but i think that uh, one of our problems today is that many people have forgot who it is that gives us freedom and safety in in this life and uh makes us free uh and that's god himself um so that's the one we don't want to forget so i, I want to read a, a passage of uh, scripture this morning, uh, and it speaks of that, uh, and it says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land, then there's a lot of healing that needs to be in these days, we are we are a country that 
we're, we're together. We're free to do whatever we wish. Um, some people choose not to honor uh, God or the flag. I uh, kneel for the cross and stand for the flag. And uh, But we all need to pray. The scripture says, I would that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And uh, we need uh, love in our lives. We need love in our country and love in the world. And the love of God is the answer to all our woes. And uh, so if you would pray with me this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, today that you forget our sins. You forget our shortcomings. And you're with us all the way. The battle is yours. And, and we thank you, Lord. We have not forsaken you. And we know that you are going to answer our prayer. You're going to keep our country safe, our people safe. And you're going to make provision for our lives and the life to come. So we thank you for those that have come out today. And, uh, Father, we we thank you uh, for all of these that have given their lives. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid on his life for a friend. We thank you for those that, who have done that. And, and we thank you for all the people that are here today. Bless America, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Godsey. Good morning and welcome to the Monroe County 9-11 Remembrance Ceremony. 20 years ago, the most tragic day in our nation's history came to pass. On a clear, sunny day in New York, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C., we were attacked and lost 2,977 Americans to a horrific terrorist plot. That figure includes 343 FDNY firefighters and paramedics, 23 New York City police officers, 37 Port Authority police officers, and 8 EMT paramedics who were struggling to complete an evacuation of the building and save the office workers trapped on higher floors in the World Trade Center buildings. Little did we know that this was just the beginning of the sacrifice for our nation. In the ensuing conflicts, as a direct result of those attacks, we have also lost over 7,000 service members since that day. Please note a special tribute of 13 flags placed in the ground to represent the 11 Marines, one Navy corpsman, and one Army soldier who were killed as a result of an enemy attack while supporting non-combat evacuation operations in Afghanistan, the last service members to die in the final days of the war. I want to recognize those service members because as a firefighter and former service member, we all take an oath to protect and serve our communities and nation. That is our purpose today, to come together to pay tribute to all of their commitment to duty, honor, and sacrifice. Respect for our oath is why when we lose one of our own, we mourn together and we mourn publicly, and we celebrate and honor their sacrifice. We are telling the loved ones in their community we will never forget. And that is why we built this special place for remembrance. Today we stand together for and in memory of our fallen. We stand for the fulfillment of that sacred oath of duty, honor, and sacrifice to protect our fellow citizens. That same oath that every man and woman present who wears a uniform has taken and is committed to. And for that reason we gather and we remember, and we appreciate the duty, the honor, and the ultimate sacrifice made by each of the following public safety members represented by this beautiful memorial today. As the day is my last official ceremony as Honor Guard Coordinator, I would like to once again thank those who contributed to the building and maintenance of this memorial. Ivy Tech and Chancellor Jenny Vaughn for this beautiful location, Gerald Sowers and Souders Landscaping for continuing to update the area around the memorial, the Clear Creek Stone Company for the limestone that makes up the memorial, Stonecutter and Ellettsville firefighter Travis Abrams who helped design the memorial and cut the stone, and finally the City of Bloomington and Bloomington Firefighters Local 586 for their support that made this project a reality. Thank you for attending this morning 
God bless and protect our military and first responders. You and I have remarks by Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton. Thank you very much, Bob, and uh, welcome to all of you, friends and neighbors. It is good to see you here uh, on this solemn occasion. And let me add sincere thanks to the Bloomington Metropolitan Firefighters Union of Local 586, who organize and are leading today's ceremony. We gather to reflect on and pay homage to the lives of your counterparts and all the public safety personnel who died in the line of duty, rushing in while thousands rushed out 20 years ago today. Some sacrificing themselves that shocking day, others lost and still being lost the long-term effects of their selfless and dedicated service in New York, Washington, and Shanksville. At the same time, we take this chance to salute our local public safety officers for your unwavering dedication to our community. And we remember all of those nearly 3,000 lives lost that tragic day, each one of them, someone's child, someone's parent, someone's sibling, a co-worker, a neighbor, a friend. We gather today, 20 years later, to honor each of them and to ensure that they are not forgotten. We gather to create meaning beyond the immediate and ghastly loss of that day. This anniversary lets us grieve and honor and also lets us consider the time gone by. In 20 years, a whole generation of Americans has grown up in the aftermath of this national tragedy that they did not experience firsthand. They have grown up in a world changed with the legacy of those devastating attacks. From airport security measures to involvement in our country's longest ever war in Afghanistan to new international stress points and pressures and cultural and religious divides. Growing up after 9-11 may have given them and all of us a heightened sense of global awareness. For those of us who remember that day so vividly and its aftermath, we can remember the tangible feeling of togetherness, the shared love of country and shared concern for our future. The coming together on September 12th beyond geography or generation, or political party, or race, to feel, really feel at a personal emotional level, the connections and vulnerabilities and dependencies that we share. In the 20 years since, still other emergencies of global proportions have reminded us how closely we are all connected. Climate change the refugee crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. Isn't it right to hope that these current global challenges might similarly bring us closer together to feel the shared future and the emotional connections again? It, it, it almost seems naive to wish so, but is it? Or is it deeply hopeful and very important? It is a dangerous and demoralizing thing when great challenges or threats, rather than bringing us together, pull us apart and aggravate our prejudices and misgivings. 
perhaps a powerful legacy of 9-11 could be to remind us that we can come together as people, as a country, as a planet, emotionally, at a very human level, when confronted with grave threats. Not just can, but really must. These global forces and phenomena and challenges that bring distant places and people into closer connections and closer view remind us here of our chance, our obligation, to play a role on the world's stage. Just last week, desperate Afghan families fleeing the Taliban began to arrive in Indiana, perhaps as many as 5,000 Afghans on the way. Many, many Hoosiers are welcoming them with hospitality and clothing, food, shelter, including our own community, as we have reached out to the resettlement agencies to identify how we can help. Bloomington has a long history of welcoming folks fleeing oppressive situations, and we look forward to becoming home to some of these new Hoosier Afghan families. Like many before them, they will become our neighbors, our schoolmates, our co-workers, and these connections will create just that much more understanding in the world. So 20 years after one of our nation's darkest days, let our commitment to human rights, our embrace of multiculturalism, and our empathy toward all be our guideposts toward the light. 20 years later, let us refresh our understanding that global challenges demand local attention and action rooted in love and dedicated to advancing equity, to lifting up our shared humanity, feeling that shared humanity in our bones, and to making our undeniably interconnected destinies just a bit brighter. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Hamilton. Choosing of the 9-11 keynote speaker has always been someone who can give a relevant and thoughtful address of not only events of that day, but the years after. As we have concluded the longest war in American history, I felt this year would be appropriate to seek out someone who served during that time and give their reflections. This year's keynote fits that bill. Colonel White retired as a field artillery officer in the Indiana Army National Guard in 2020 after 30 years of service. He held command positions at the battery, battalion, brigade, and provisional task force levels while assigned at 2-150th Field Artillery Regiment, 38th Infantry Division, and the 81st Troop Command. Colonel White was called to active duty in support of Operation Enduring Freedom for three overseas mobilizations. He serves as the chief of an embedded training team with the Light Infantry Battalion of the Afghanistan National Army 2004-2005, where he was awarded the Combat Action Badge. A second tour in Afga Afghanistan 2009-2010 as a commander of a provisional task force responsible for base operations and force protection of Kabul, and was awarded the Bronze Star as officer in charge. Task Force Spartan, Jordan, 2019-2020, where he served as the senior army officer in Jordan, directing the 38th Infantry Division's forward command post and assistance assisting Jordanian Army partners. Colonel White is currently works at IU Bloomington as the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships. Please welcome Colonel Kirk White. Well, thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you for your very kind uh, introduction. And thanks to our uh, Bloomington Firefighters Local 586, uh, Ivy Tech, and the City of Bloomington for supporting and continuing this annual event that's very important for our community. Well, good morning, friends. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to join you today as, as we share our thoughts about this day of commemoration. It's a day that we observe 
we honor those who gave their lives and we celebrate those who were ordinary heroes. We also reflect on how the attack on our country changed the course of life for all Americans. It is truly well described as Patriot Day. When you think about it, many young Americans were not born or too young to know the details and grasp the full impacts of this harrowing day in our country's history. Allow me, uh, I, as I see some young people in the crowd, perhaps uh, less than 20 years old, allow me to read the most concise description I could find from the National September 11th Memorial and Museum. And I quote, On September 11th, 2001, 19 terrorists associated with Al-Qaeda, an Islamist extremist group, hijacked four commercial airplanes scheduled to fly from the East Coast to California. In a coordinated attack that turned the planes into weapons, the terrorists intentionally flew two of the planes into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, a global business complex in New York City, which caused the towers to collapse. They also flew a third plane into the Pentagon, the headquarters of the United States Department of Defense in Arlington, Virginia. Passengers and crew members on the fourth plane launched a counterattack, forcing the hijacker pilot who was flying the airplane toward Washington, D.C. to crash the plane into a field in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, near the town of Shanksville. The 9-11 attacks killed 2,977 people on that day. This was the single largest loss of life resulting from a foreign attack on American soil. The attacks caused the deaths of 441 first responders, the greatest loss of emergency responders on a single day in American history. And I close quote there from the museum. It was truly a horrific day. In addition to the Twin Towers, American Airlines Flight 77 that crashed into the Pentagon resulted in 183 deaths. United Airlines Flight 93 that crashed in Pennsylvania resulted in 45 deaths. Those 19 hijackers and their Al-Qaeda planners took advantage of weaknesses in the security systems of the day. They entered the U.S. on various visas easily moved around the country, taking advantage of our freedoms. They took flying lessons in Florida. They studied aircraft and crew protocols, down almost to selecting the largest planes that would be most loaded with jet fuel in order to maximize damage. It was a well-coordinated attack. Most of us remember where we were when the attacks occurred on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. Think back for a moment about where you were. I'm sure it's a day you'll never forget. It was a sunny, blue sky day in Bloomington. I was at home on the south side of Bloomington. It was my day to take our four-year-old daughter, Reagan, to preschool. And we had a late start that day. I think I see some four or five-year-olds in the crowd today. I was watching the morning news on television, as I always do when we get breakfast. At 8.51 a.m., I listened to Matt Lauer on the Today Show when he reported the first plane hit the tower. I watched and I thought, this must have been some rare mechanical failure. Nobody would fly into the side of the tallest building in New York City on a blue sky day. By the second impact, it was clear that this was no accident. Reagan, our four-year-old, could tell that my wife Jan and I were nervous about what was on television, but in her innocence, she just thought it was another television program. My mind started racing that what all this meant 
as I buckled Reagan into her booster seat in the back of the car. I had live news kind of loudly playing on the car radio as we passed College Mall that morning. Reagan asked me from the back seat in kind of a low voice, Daddy, what is happening? I tried to explain in simple terms that bad people had attacked New York City. And to this day, I can still her, hear her trepid voice when she said, Are we going to be okay in Bloomington? Yes, we'll be fine in Bloomington here, I said, trying to be calm and reassuring. But I expected things were not going to be all right. Even that early in the day, I knew that this was the first successful attack on America since Pearl Harbor. 60 years earlier. Like many of us here today, I had no idea the impact it would have on me and my family. As then an Army National Guard captain, I thought about the remote possibility that the Guard would be called to active duty. And then at 9.39 a.m., as my co-workers and I watched from our conference room in Bryan Hall on the IU campus, came the news of the Pentagon attack and later the crash in Pennsylvania. We were certainly a nation under attack. The Fire Department of New York, 1st Battalion Chief Joseph Pfeiffer, also knew we were under attack that morning. But as the first incident commander on the scene of the World Trade Center, he had an immediate job to do. In his book, Ordinary Heroes, he describes how he and his fellow firefighters did, quote, ordinary things on an extraordinary day in our country's history, close quote. As he raced to the scene of the towers, he knew that this would likely be the most difficult but the most significant day of his then 20-year career in the department. But as a humble leader, he may have described his work as ordinary, but we all know that the first responders on 9-11 did extraordinary things just as our nation's responders do every day. Over the next 20 years, I was mobilized three times to fight the global war on terrorism, two of which were one-year tours of duty in Afghanistan, where Al-Qaeda trained for those 9-11 attacks. During my first tour, I was assigned to lead a team of U.S. Army advisors embedded with a light infantry battalion of the then new National Army of Afghanistan. On this date, September 11th, 2004, 17 years ago, I made remarks at a commemoration much like this one here today. But I was at our NATO base in Kunduz province, the site where the last of the Taliban had surrendered in late November 2001. At that ceremony in 2004, the flags of 11 countries, including Afghanistan, were lowered to half staff by the representatives of the soldiers from those countries who were fighting there then in honor of those who gave their lives three years earlier during the attacks in the United States. As I stood there in front of the formation and looked into the eyes of those soldiers from those allied countries, all there to help us bring peace and security to Afghanistan, I addressed the group thanking them for their dedication and proclaiming that their really wasn't any other place I'd rather be on September 11th than alongside them serving shoulder to shoulder. It was a time of great hope for Afghanistan, and you could feel it everywhere. The first free presidential election would be held the following month. Women were able to vote for the first time. Girls were going to school. Universities were open. Infrastructure was being rebuilt. And aside from the occasional insurgent attacks, it was a relatively stable time. As I left the country in July of 2005, I felt hopeful for the future and sad to leave so many of my new Afghan friends behind. 
And I'll add this morning that one of those great Afghan friends, my interpreter who served on my, my hip a whole year long, is right now in Indiana at Camp Atterbury helping translate for the thousands of new immigrants coming to our country. And I'll be seeing him later today. As I returned to Afghanistan five years later to command base operations and force protection for those three bases in Kabul, the city had changed with more commerce, schools, cell phone towers, traffic, and pollution. But one part, big part had changed for the worse and that was the security situation. The insurgents had made many advances, and there was constant threat of attacks against anything that resembled international forces. Further, though we had significantly grown the Afghan security forces, their quality and ability, ability to sustain themselves had not improved. In briefing after briefing, I heard the same challenges that we experienced five years earlier. There had been little improvement. But we held our heads high, focused on our mission, and were truly hopeful that we could turn the tide and bring peace and stability. Ironically, eight years after I heard Matt Lauer report from the first tower attack, I found myself standing alongside him when he came to my base to broadcast the Today Show live from Kabul in 2009. During my service, like all other first responders, I had the unwavering support of my family, our Bloomington community, my church, and my employer. Really only during this past year, after my retirement from military service, have I learned of the sacrifices that my family really made while I was away and are still burdened with today. During my service, they did not want to bother me with their problems and worries back here at home so that I could focus on my mission. But their anguish was real. My wife Jan had a habit of not following the news while I was deployed. Our daughters constantly worried about my safety, no matter how much I would reassure them. And I'll bet this sounds familiar to all those first responders that we have here today. It was true of the first responders who left home on the morning of September 11th, 412 of them of which gave their lives to save thousands of others and then did not come home to their families that evening. You know, when faced with overwhelming tragedy, we asked why? Well, the 911 terrorists carefully planned their targets to best demonstrate to the world that Al Qaeda had declared a holy war against the United States, including U.S. support of Israel, sanctions against Iraq, U.S. presence in Saudi Arabia, the perceived support of oppression against Muslims, American immorality, and the spread of Western values. Then we asked, how could this happen? It became clear that the most powerful country on earth had become complacent in the Cold War era. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, we really had no peer adversaries. Throughout the 1990s, Russia's military grew even weaker. In fact, when I attended the U.S. Army Field Artillery Officer Basic Course in 1992, the school was struggling to name an adversary for which we should plan against, instead just replacing Warsaw Pact with the generic term, the threat. Additionally, probably because they did not see the need to do so, further study has shown that our defense and intelligence agencies did not share information and did not know that others had relevant intelligence to share. Clearly, our early warning and defense system designed for a Cold War threat simply were not able to detect or effectively respond to the asymmetric terrorist threats, particularly our own civilian aircraft being used as weapons. It was inconceivable. In 2001, we just couldn't imagine that a successful non-nuclear attack on our homeland could succeed. 
So today and now, we can honor the sacrifices of those souls that we lost on 9-11 and the subsequent global war on terrorism by learning the lessons the learning the lessons from the past 20 years and focus now on a secure future for the next generation of Americans and our allies. In the aftermath of 9-1-1, the U.S. undertook the most significant restructuring of our home front security organizations in our history. The outdated civil defense structure of the Cold War was retired. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security was quickly established to coordinate a unified effort of protecting our borders. Intelligence fusion centers have been established in almost every state. Interoperable communications have become the standard, linking first responding agencies at all levels. The concepts of incident command system were developed into emergency management systems that is now universal to all responder agencies and exercised regularly. Emergency management has become a recognized field of study with research and teaching done by hundreds of colleges and universities. In 2005, the response to Hurricane Katrina, many of these new capabilities were first implemented and many more weaknesses were realized, but now we continue to improve. In many ways, the attacks on September 11th were successful because we as planners and responders didn't use our imagination to prepare for worst case scenarios. And now my friends, because of those who are hell bent against our freedom, I'm certain that the next attacks from foreign threats will happen. Domestic terrorism, natural and man-made disasters will continue to confront us and perhaps be beyond what we have experienced thus far. The COVID-19 pandemic is an example where we knew a disease of this type could spread throughout the world, killing millions. But as we have witnessed, we did not put the plans and logistics in place in advance to manage the disaster. Our challenge now is to fight this complacency, take our lessons learned, continue to aggressively mitigate the many threats and risks that are at our doorstep and continue, we need to continue to build on our capabilities. So I am also certain that we will meet these challenges and we will prevail because of the dedication of those who respond every day. Certainly, they're not just ordinary heroes. As we come to the formal recognition and laying of the wreath on this blue sky morning, I'd like to share the words from one of my favorite poems, written by the poet Lloyd Stone, with later verses by Methodist theologian Georgia Harkness. It is entitled, This is My Song, A Song of Peace. And it reads, <clears throat> This is my song, O God of the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country skies are bluer than the ocean, and sunlight beams on clover leaf and pine. But other lands have sunlight too and clover, and skies are everywhere as blue as mine. Oh, hear my song, O oh God of the nations, a song of peace for their land and mine. May truth and freedom come to every nation. May peace abound where strife has raged so long, that each may seek to love and build together, a world united, righting every wrong, a world united in its love for freedom, proclaiming peace 
together in one song. Thank you very much for having me here today. It's been a pleasure to share this day with you. Good morning. Guard and companies, Please rise for the presentation of the memorial wreath. Men and women of today's fire service are confronted with a more dangerous work environment than ever before. We are forced to continually change our strategies and tactics to accomplish our tasks. Our methods may change, but our goals remain the same as they were in the past, to save lives and to protect property, sometimes at a terrible cost. This is what we do. This is our chosen profession. This is the tradition of the firefighters. The fire service of today is ever-changing, but is steeped in a tradition 200 years old. One such tradition is the sound of a bell. In the past, as firefighters began their tour of duty, it was the bell that signaled the beginning of that day's shift. Throughout the day and night, each alarm was sounded by a bell, which summoned these brave souls to fight fires and to place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow citizens. And when the fire was out and the alarm had come to an end, it was the bell that signaled to all the completion of that call. When a firefighter had died in the line of duty, paying the supreme sacrifice, it was the mournful toll of the bell that solemnly announced the comrade's passing. We utilize these traditions as symbols, which reflect honor and respect on those who have given so much and who have served so well. To symbolize the devotion that these brave souls had for their duty, a special signal of three rings, three times each, represents the end of our comrades' duties and that they will be returning to quarters. And so, to those who have selflessly given their lives for the good of their fellow man, their tasks completed, their duties well done, to our comrades, their last alarm, they are going home. Uniform personnel, present our
ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this morning's ceremony. Hunter Company dismissed.